just to uh, let everyone know before we start, uh, kindly do keep your mic muted at all times. If you wish to have your video on, you may do so, but please do keep your mics muted. Uh, so today is our first of uh, four workshops on uh, climate and disaster risk management, risk transfer and related laws and policies. Uh, today's workshop will focus on addressing loss and damage through nationally determined contributions. We have an excellent lineup of speakers, and uh, we also have a breakout group session that will happen a little later. We hope you all could stay on until the end of uh, the session. So uh, maybe just to get started, I will also drop a registration form to also get an idea of who uh, who's here and who's joining the call on the chat shortly. But uh, just to get started, I would now like to invite Dr. Kunimal Jayatunga, Additional Secretary to the Ministry of Environment of Sri Lanka, to some opening remarks. Dr. Jayatunga. Yeah, uh, thank you, Sinasia. And uh, good morning and also good afternoon to the participants who join into this um, consultation. Uh, first of all, let me appreciate um, Spike and Trust for uh, inviting me and uh, giving this opportunity for me to share that um, the Sri Lanka's NDC's um, formulation process as well as the how that uh, loss and damage uh, came into the uh, Sri Lanka's NDC's. <coughs> uh, Ministry of Environment is the uh, national focal point to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Uh, being the national focal point to the UNFCCC, Sri Lanka signed the Paris Agreement on 22nd April 2016, and it was ratified in 21st September in 2016. So du during this period, uh, Sri Lanka submitted uh, the nationally determined contribution as Sri Lanka's national commitment under the Paris Agreement. <coughs> uh, Sri Lanka's NDCs um, comprises of mainly four main areas. The uh, uh, first one is um, mitigation, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So um, there are uh, five sectors have been identified in Sri Lanka to uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, energy, transport, industry, waste, and forestry. Uh, in addition to that, um, we identified that Sri Lanka being a tropical island in the Indian Ocean, Sri Lanka is highly vulnerable to adverse impact of climate change, especially prolonged droughts, uh, as well as um, flash floods and landslides due to intensive rainfalls, and also sea level rise, storms, hurricanes, uh, etc. are the major uh, adverse impact of climate change Sri Lanka is facing. So identifying that vulnerability in order to build resilience of uh, the most affected uh, sectors, communities, and geographical areas, we identified eight sectors to be <clears throat> built resilient under the adaptation. So those eight sectors, if I recall now, agriculture, fisheries, livestock as uh, food security, and also health, coastal, uh, biodiversity and ecosystems, uh, coastal and marine, uh, tourism uh, and recreation, and uh, urban, uh, develop, urban city planning, and human settlement. <clears throat> so in addition to this uh, adaptation and mitigation NDCs, we identified that it is a good opportunity for Sri Lanka uh, being a, a non-annex one party to the UNFCCC to um, include loss and damage. The loss and damage is one of the sector we identified because as we know that when a disaster occurred, so we being a developing country and with our uh, national capacity, we are unable to, uh, to cover all the losses and damages, paying compensation or even 
um, providing reliefs or providing what the losses. And uh, so therefore that in when we when you see our Sri Lanka's indices, so we um, <coughs> provided because we have existing mechanisms to uh, cover some losses and damage due to disasters, but it is not covered or uh, complying as uh, also in terms of mechanism of loss and damage. So therefore, uh, our mainly that uh, loss and damage related indices focus to strengthen our national mechanisms to meet the uh, the, the standards of the um, architecture which will be developed through the negotiation under the Warsaw International Mechanism on Loss and Damage. You know, in Sri Lanka, um, especially we have uh, 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 the re risk transferring systems with also the properties. But when a, a disaster occurred, there are many uh, uh, losses and damages uh, happening uh, to, to the uh, environment and also socio-economic impacts, also economic losses and damage. So the, uh, even in, in, in the country that whole uh, losses and damages are not measured. So we incorporated to our NDCs to first of the dimension of um, uh, the losses and damages due to climate-induced disasters. And also, you know that uh, under the Warsaw in in, in, uh, also, in, also uh, international mechanism on loss and damage that um, non-economic values also have to be valued. So there are many areas to be covered, which we see that uh, uh, the, with the scope of the also international mechanism. So those things we have incorporated to our indices. You know that uh, we, we submitted in 2016 our indices to be implemented during the 2020 to 2030 period. Um, in order to um, get prepared in terms of uh, loss and damage, I'm telling, uh, uh, and also covering other sectors, we prepared the readiness plan covering uh, 2017 to 2019. There are three year action plan. In fact, it, that uh, fill the gaps, especially related to policies, legal, institutional, research, assessments. There are so many areas we identified that in order to implement our NDCs, there are a lot of gaps. In order to fill that gaps, um, this readiness action plan was um, formulated and implemented. Damage, in fact, we wanted to assess the pastors and also try to value, to get uh, value, value or, uh, to assess the losses and damages. So in that way, we, we, we are trying that <clears throat> to understand uh, the, the gravity of the losses and damage due to, and also to get prepared uh, mechanisms to uh, manage those. Uh, and also I want to highlight here that um, we review uh, and update uh, the, 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 the uh, Sri Lanka's NDC submitted in 2016. The process has been already completed. Now some officials is doing before submitting to the uh, UNFCCC. <coughs> Loss and damage sector also review. And uh, we were able to, in fact, update this because of, uh, you know, now almost uh, uh, four or five years. So during that time, we were able to <clears throat> collect uh, the information what we need <coughs> to uh, implement our indices and also to showcase most potential as well as implementable and attainable indices. So I want to, um, uh, also I was um, highlighting that uh, during the, uh, 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 the updating process of our indices, loss and damage also gave a priority, and <clears throat> it was <clears throat> it was um, amended or updated with the new uh, data and information we were able to gather during the uh, implementation of readiness uh, process. And also, I want to highlight here that not only uh, that 
path loss and damage in our ndcs as you know uh, there are uh, many other sectors in those highlight that cross cutting of our ndcs addressing loss and damage especially agriculture in our agriculture sector ndcs also cover the uh, risk management as well as risk transfer and also in uh, uh, human settlement sector irrigation water all those sectors also uh, indirectly this loss and damages are covered so uh, without taking uh, much time uh, let me conclude my opening remarks and uh, thank you very much for giving this opportunity for me to share the sri lanka's experience on uh, ndc's formulation and how the uh, loss and damage sector was integrated to our uh, sri lanka's ndc's and how uh, sri lanka's ndc's that uh, loss and damage um, is reflecting is reflecting in other sectors so i think uh, uh, i have almost um, share with you the experience and if you need any further information i could share with you later on um, uh, i think this is a timely and also it is very important to assess so discuss this type of um, uh, uh, a new um, uh, loss and damage Later to NDCs, and uh, I take this opportunity once again uh, to thank uh, Slack and Trust for organizing this um, timely, important uh, workshop, and also giving this opportunity for me to share the uh, Sri Lankan experience. I thank you very much. Thank you, Senasia. Thank you, Dr. Jayatanga, and um, thank you very much to everyone who has joined us. Um, just to let everyone. You know, until our next speaker, Vasita, gets back, uh, is um, done on her video. Uh, just let everyone know we have uh, dropped a link on the uh, chat for registration. Please disregard the previous link. There is a new link that uh, you dropped on the chat. Please do fill that out just to get an understanding of who's on the call. And so this would also serve as a virtual registration. Um, also, we I would like to kindly request everyone to rename yourself on Zoom. Um, I'll also drop uh, the instruction how to do that with your country so that it will help us uh, put you into the relevant breakout groups. So thank you, Dr. Jayatendra, once again, and thank you to everyone who's also joined us on Facebook. I would now like to invite our Executive Director, Ms. Vasita Vijayanayaka, for her address. Uh, was it there? Yes. Hello. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm just having a bit of a disaster with my laptop, which is giving way in the middle of this presentation. So um, if my presentation does not appear clearly, I apologize. Uh, just let me try to screen share and hopefully it will work. Okay. Um, Sunny, can you see the screen? Yes. Yeah, All right. Okay. Um, okay. So Thank you everyone who joined. I'm Vasita Vijayanayaka. I'm joining from Columbus, Sri Lanka. And thank you, Dr. Jayatanga, for that very informative speech. I was joining in and listening in to what you're saying. Um, so I will just speak a bit about what Slack and Trust does in terms of loss and damage work and how it connects to uh, the DNDC process uh, at national and international level. Um, so Slack and Trust focuses on different thematic areas which refer to um, coastal or rather ecosystems, biodiversity and conservation. And then we also focus on uh, the policy and research aspect of work on climate change, sustainable development and social justice related aspects uh, and stakeholder engagement, as well as um, climate and disaster risk management. Um, and again, human and animal conflict, wildlife, biodiversity conservation. Um, so going through these ones, uh, you would see that there's a relevance to what we focus on in DCs. Um, and um, as Dr. Jasanga mentioned, in Sri Lanka, there were 14 sectors, and uh, most of these themes overlap with um, what we um, work on. Um, we primarily work as a think tank, uh, so there's a lot of research capacity building and policy related work that we do. Um, and NDCs are part of our key work that we do at national level. 
Um, and at the international level, we engaged uh, engaging the international processes, which relate to UNFCCC. Uh, we work on capacity building uh, webinars, which were summits that we've been doing in 2019. Uh, and then we work with the Oceans Expert Group of the UNFCCC, uh, the NAP Technical Working Group, uh, and the NAP Work Program. Um, so several international processes that relate to the NDCs and the work related to climate change. Um, and additionally, we work um, on resilience building, which connect with the NDCs um, in countries in Africa and Asia, and also research on nationally determined contributions. So I'll focus on the last one because we recently, as in 2019, we completed a research that was a regional one uh, in Asia uh, for Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, and Nepal. Uh, and this created a lot of knowledge products and also supported and contributed the NDC process or rather, uh, engaging the stakeholders into the NDC process and finding the gaps and needs with the stakeholder engagement. Um, so here we also partnered with the government of Sri Lanka, Dr. Jasmine was uh, guiding the process as well. Uh, and we contributed the review process through the consultations and the research outputs. And similarly in the countries of Nepal and Bangladesh, this was also identified as a knowledge product that uh, could feed into the NDC process. We have a few speakers from these uh, countries, so they could potentially provide more information. Um, just to give a quick overview of uh, the comparative aspects. Yes. Um, so as you know, uh, on the NDC front, uh, in the 2016 uh, submissions, or the ones that were converted into NDCs through the ratification process, uh, over a quarter of the countries had a component on NDCs. And then uh, it was seen that the developing countries had this as a priority more than the developed ones in their ones. Uh, so for example, 44% uh, of the SIDS and 34% of the least developed countries. So this is from another research um, that was published that I have quoted it. It's not one of our researches, but there's a calculation that was made. Um, and through our research, we mapped the NDCs of the three countries uh, where there were different elements of loss and damage connected to the NDC. Some not directly connected in the sense that there is a, there is a separation as loss and damage, uh, but Sri Lankan one of course had loss and damage uh, as a key component with separate NDCs um, as Dr. Chatham explained, uh, listed in it. So there was the setup of uh, the way, was it international mechanism, a national one, and then there was a focus on insurance, climate and disaster insurance uh, as a risk transfer mechanism and then um, setting up the women national level covers many aspects related to loss and damage, for example, migration, uh, gender, all these that cover the discussion around WIM. So while they were not specifically listed as one, two, three, uh, the elements of WIM that gets integrated through the national mechanism, it was potentially possible to focus on these aspects under loss and damage and the NDCs. Um, so for uh, Bangladesh, um, there are components of disaster management, social protection included, and livelihoods that get impacted by um, climate impacts. And then um, in Nepal, there was climate-induced disasters that were highlighted. So this was a research that was published in 2009 uh, with several partners, um, including uh, some government entities like the Climate Change Secretariat that contributed to this, uh, and different partners in Nepal and Bangladesh. Uh, so we're grateful to all the partners who contributed this. But uh, post um, this publication, some countries already have reviewed um, and incorporated these aspects into the NDC. So there's, there's more that has happened since the publication was finalized in 2019. But still, you can find some of the gaps and needs which would be relevant and could be built on when you are developing the NDCs or implementing NDCs. So um, identifying the gaps and needs, um, just to focus on what we uh, found. So if you want to um, read the whole publications, uh, you can access it on our website, uh, psychandtrust.org. Uh, and our knowledge portal has uh, country papers for each country, which highlights the gaps and needs uh, that were highlighted by different stakeholders. Uh, and also the comparative study, which focuses on the three countries and also how to address these gaps and needs. Um, so some of the key gaps contain capacity building gaps, research data gaps, um, and also uh, um, how to implement and finance uh, the actions. Um, and this was also highlighted through another research that, that we did in 2020 uh, with civil society organizations across the world, uh, which also highlights the need to technical capacity building uh, across 
uh, the, the world, uh, not just necessarily Asia, uh, on loss and damage related discussions so that the civil society could um, contribute to the processes more effectively. And also it was highlighted that there was need to kind of calculate the losses and damages, what kind of uh, assessment processes can, can be um, used. Um, and then the attribution factors were questioned. So there are a lot of discussion around this. And these are elements that we could build on when we are discussing the implementation and also the review process of NDCs. Uh, and I would like to also highlight the, the key aspect of risk assessment that would go into this. Um, and then elements of risk transfer, as well as migration um, and mobility, because across the research that we've been doing in 2020, uh, this has been a key component that was highlighted that though this is not documented that this is happening, this could be temporary displacement or human mobility, but, uh, but that this is important to be focused on. So uh, when you're looking at the versus international mechanism uh, and we focus on loss and damage, this is a key discussion that's happening. So we could look into how uh, the different stakeholders working on climate change could contribute to um, providing inputs and data and other research and knowledge, knowledge products so that the country NDCs could include all these aspects when going forward to the review process or developing implementation plans. Um, so we also have to focus on the resilience building. We need to identify the losses and damages. We need to ensure that there is a, a process where different stakeholders could contribute and scale up climate action. Um, and then also where does the finance come for implementing all these actions. Um, I would take the discussion forward to our uh, group sessions um, and see how we could build on these aspects. And also the next three sessions that come up will have different elements of what I highlighted uh, hi um, more elaborated and discussed in detail with more expert input. Um, so to wrap up, I would like to say if you need more information on the research that we've been doing, the work that we do on these topics, uh, kindly refer to the Slack and Trust website uh, and our knowledge portal. All these publications are available. And I would request all the other speakers who uh, are from these countries that we work in and also not from these, but have worked with us at the international level to please elaborate further on any points that I've highlighted that you think uh, you could build on as well. Thank you. Um, thank you, Rosita, for that. And uh, now I would like to invite Mr. Hafi Julkan, who is a negotiator for the Deep Sea Country Group, to make his presentation. Um, thank you so much. Uh, okay. Hello, um, friends and colleagues. Uh, I would like to share some of my thoughts and views on how the indices can address loss and damage. In terms of why, um, let me put uh, great emphasis on the um, uh, continuum that is mitigation, adaptation, loss and damage is a continuum. So it, we know that due to inadequate efforts for mitigation and adaptation, now loss and damage is the reality. Scientific and research communities are providing clear evidences on existing and potential loss and damage associated with, with climate change. So on the other hand, global political community also accepted uh, loss and damage as a third period of climate change through the Article 8 of the Paris Agreement. Later in Katowice, when we developed the um, Katowice rule book, loss and damage was also included in the uh, global st stock take processes and also in the, within the transparency framework. So now it's clear that uh, loss and damage is the third pillar or important uh, policy pillar for uh, international, even national climate change policies, plans, and legislations. So in terms of uh, Paris Agreement, uh, NDCs, when it is a main vehicle to communicate or to, uh, for the commitments, so uh, we must need address loss and damage to the indices process. But if you look at the initial indices, where we do see, was it also mentioned that is 34% LDCs and 44% uh, seats countries um, elaborated loss and damage uh, under their indices. But if you look at the current situation, that was the deadline for 2020. Uh -huh that is to submit the revised NDCs. We do see some of the LDCs, including Bangladesh, Nepal, Jambia, Ethiopia, uh, submitted their revised uh, NDCs. 
unfortunately, within these countries, we do see included loss and damage very clearly, and they um, express that they would like to take initiatives to avoid the loss and damage. They also mentioned that they would like to develop national strategy and action plan, particularly on loss and damage by 2025. That is really idea. So uh, what I want to say that is in the why any climate related action or plans that needs to address the loss and damage considering the third pillar of the uh, international and national policies for uh, climate change. Now we think about how, that is a critical question, how we can address loss and damage within these policies and plans. First of all, in terms of loss and damage, we need to think about to understand the nature of loss and damage. You know, the nature of the loss and damage is really critical. So at the national level, even within the participation of community, we need to identify specific tools and methodologies to identify or to understand the nature of the loss, loss and damage. Once we can do understand the nature of loss and damage, then it would be helpful to identify to identify the right approaches to deal with loss and damage. And once we can identify the right, right approaches, then those approaches needs to be institutionalized through relevant policies, plans, even legislations. Finally, uh, which is very important that uh, to address loss and damage at the vulnerable countries, particularly we need financial, technical and capacity support, uh, particularly from the developed countries. So, uh, overall, at the national level, um, we need to develop kind of a national mechanism. That's what Bangladesh company is thinking last few years to develop a national mechanism where all these um, critical issues uh, can be um, materialized within that national mechanism. With that uh, inspiration or aspiration, Bangladesh government is trying to develop that national mechanism. So at the end, I would like to emphasize that indices that needs to address loss and damage comprehensively. Second, uh, NAP, National Adaptation Plan, uh, that can be another, another vehicle where we can address loss and damage. But what I want to emphasize is that uh, even indices, NAPs, we can utilize those vehicles, but, and, uh, but finally, we need to develop national strategy and action plan. That's what Nepal suggested uh, in their indices. So um, there is a need, a specific strategy and action plan for loss and damage at the national level. These kind of national mechanisms or strategy and action plans needs to be um, connected with Warsaw International Mechanism because Warsaw International Mechanism at this moment that is the um, that drives the international policy debates and policy discourse. So there must be a clear synergies, linkage between national mechanisms or national strategies and the Warsaw International Mechanism. At the same time, we, we do need um, to think about regional um, collaboration because to some extent, you need to address loss and damage with regional collaborations. For example, if we think about the risk, risk transfer issues, uh, we can think about regional insurance mechanism. Some of the region, the region, they already started the regional initiatives for risk transfer. So um, at the bottom, I would like to um, uh, say that we need to develop local, national, regional, and international policy and legal framework to address the loss and damage comprehensively. So and this is a very good uh, starting point and I put emphasis, every LDC need to address the loss and damage in their uh, indices. Also try to um, address the um, limitations of adaptation and the critical issues in the national adaptation plans. And finally, national strategies and um, national mechanism. Let me stop here. Uh, I'd be happy to respond to any of questions uh, it comes to me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Khan, and uh, thank you very much to everyone who's joined us. Uh, just a few um, next up, sorry, before I proceed. Before uh, next up, we have uh, Mr. George Mamukoya. He's the lead negotiator for agriculture from the African Group of Negotiators. Uh, Mr. George, if you could maybe unmute yourself. 
I would also like to go through a few housekeeping rules. Kindly do keep your mic muted at all times. Um, if you have questions for the speakers, please do uh, drop them in the chat and we could take them forward. Uh, moreover, uh, we've dropped the link for registration on the chat as well. It would be great if you could uh, fill that out so we have an idea of who's on the call and if, when, if we want to connect with you later for further workshops that would also be useful and finally i would also encourage everyone to rename yourselves so with your name and the country you're joining us from so that we could uh, put you into the relevant breakout groups where after the presentations um so that's it from me for now uh, mr george thanks uh, Sanasia. Yes. yeah thanks colleagues uh, uh, i think uh, loss and damage is uh, one of uh, uh, critical areas in the in the climate change discourse. Are you getting me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Yeah, and and, and as a consequence, um, uh, the 2020 uh, provided an opportunity uh, for many countries, including uh, those our countries in Africa, uh, to as they update their indices. Uh, to factor into into their uh, NDCs, um, but let's let's start from uh, the country where I come from, Kenya. Uh, from Kenya, what has happened is that uh, we are having two processes uh, that uh, are, pro are progressed. The first uh, is, uh, is the updating of the NDC, uh, under which uh, uh, loss and damage has been uh, clearly. Uh, uh, identified as one of the uh, broad areas uh, uh, within the, 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 the updated NDC. And uh, there are specific uh, uh, provisions in, in respect to that. Uh, one, uh, the broader aspect uh, where you are looking the, where you are looking at the, 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 the comprehensive climate risk uh, management uh, systems. But uh, more importantly, that uh, there are specific provisions uh, that relate to addressing uh, uh, residual uh, climate change uh, impacts and uh, and loss of damage. And, and I think that is a departure uh, from the original uh, 2015 uh, INDC uh, uh, thereof. The second uh, area which Kenya is also involved is is in the process of developing the long term strategy. As you all recall, under Paris Agreement, uh, in particular Article 4, Paragraph 19, uh, it requires countries to develop their mid century long term uh, low emission climate resilient development pathways. And in that respect, uh, we, we, we believe uh, that, uh, again, loss and damage uh, in relation to adaptation and mitigation, as been said by colleagues, uh, will be addressed in that respect and clearly demonstrating the link between those uh, three areas. Uh, moving to, and, and therefore we do expect that uh, a, a large number of, uh, of, of African countries as the, the update their indices are going to incorporate the, the, the loss and damage uh, considerations. The reason being a large part uh, of, uh, of our economies uh, actually are dependent on the productive sectors, including agriculture and others, uh, which uh, are uh, amenable to, to loss and damage, and, and therefore it's a very critical uh, factor. At the continental level, I think we, we have three, three important uh, processes that uh, uh, would, be, uh, would be useful uh, to take note. The first one is the, the African uh, Adaptation Initiative, which is uh, an initiative that uh, was uh, uh, adopted and, uh, by the heads of state and currently is, uh, is developing uh, tools uh, that will help uh, our countries to address adaptation, uh, but also the issues related to uh, uh, loss and damage. And I think uh, Rosita and others, uh, that, that's an, an initiative that you may want to, to engage uh, as, as part of your, uh, your partnership. The other one, which I think is critical, is, um, is an evolve, evolution of uh, the African uh, uh, capacity, uh, risk capacity, uh, which primarily is started uh, as, uh, as a way of uh, providing uh, uh, 
index, kind of index-based insurance uh, to, to uh, African member states uh, and, 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 and therefore uh, helping countries to overcome uh, uh, challenges that may arise as a result of uh, uh, climate uh, risks. Uh, that is now being expanded uh, because it's, uh, it's, it's, a frame, it's an institution under the African Union. Uh, which is now uh, looking at the, 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 the risks, uh, uh, climate risk, droughts, uh, floods, and, uh, and related aspects, uh, and, and enable to, to cushion uh, the, 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 the countries and the farmers uh, in particular uh, in, in that respect. And, and therefore, uh, uh, loss and damage is, uh, is increasingly becoming an important area uh, in Africa. It was not originally uh, uh, Included in the initial uh, NDCs, uh, but now it, it has been identified and it is going to uh, to, to feature across uh, most African uh, NDCs. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mamboya. I would now like to invite Mr. Sandeep Rai, who's the senior advisor, Global Climate Adaptation Policy of the of International Climate and Energy Practice. Um, Mr. Rai, are you on the call? Okay. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, firstly, thank you so much and and happy new year, everyone. Um, so let can I share my screen very quickly? Uh, okay. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Okay. Great. So, um, firstly, thank you so much for Slack and Trust for inviting me to give this uh, my, my reflection on this important topic. Well, I will be talking about, about how to anchor loss and damage in the enhanced NDC process. And this is the, this is the report that WWF and Practical Action did um, the last October. We released this report last October, keeping in the mind that the report will be helpful for many of the countries who are in the process of uh, I would say enhancing their NDC. But having said that, this particular, uh, I would say the framework that we design will not only be helpful for this NDC cycle, but also the second NDC cycle that may take place in the year 2025. Um, so some, some of the elements, when, when what Jaws and, and what Hafiz has mentioned in his in their intervention also highlighted in this, this particular topic. And, and, and this is written jointly by myself and my colleague Sunil um, from Nepal as well. Well, he might be talking in the, in, in the uh, from me, but let me go through this report, what we had done, you know, what are some of the key steps that each country can and should is to take the initiative forward in terms of how to anchor loss and damage in the NDC process. So I will not go much more on the background part, but just to give highlight that that the climate change impact is happening everywhere. This was just a few incident, a few I would say climate related disasters that happened last last year in 2020. Apart from the COVID, what we are really struggling right now. And so so impact what we are seeing in South Asia, what we are seeing in Philippines, and, or even the World Bank report, which talk about the climate induced migration um, that might happen and where millions of people will be displaced from their territory or from their existing place to, 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 to other places. And especially this impact or this kind of migration happens due to uh, lack of water security, or uh, lack of food production, and the sea level rise, and and this is really an alarming thing. Things and the impacts is really real, and that could really happen in sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and Latin America. And we are already seeing some of these uh, these early signal uh, in some of our country in in these three continents as well. But uh, just to keep Prospective loss, loss and damage is not happening only in the developing world, but it's also in developed country. Let's like say, for example, in South Korea in August last year, where, where more than 30 people died due to extreme weather events. And, and this is really, really, really alarming. And one of the reports that I really want to highlight that the Red Cross or the uh, International Federation on Red Cross released their World Disaster Report 2020, where they say that more than 410,000 people died due to extreme weather events in last, in last I would say, 10 years or, or, or last decade. 
and where 1.7 billion people around the world were affected by the extreme weather events in in, in the past decade. So, so that's quite alarming. And Red Cross is also 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 being really upfront and being, being vocal on on the issue of of loss and damage. So let me st let me um, uh, stop that background and say say when we talk about the loss and damage, we talk about loss and damage that has two key component. One on economic loss, economic loss can be uh, can can be understood that it is lots of revenue, goods, services, and uh, and other things. I mean, it could be like the business operation, the agricultural production, or tourism, or even infrastructure or, or properties. But there are also some non-economic losses. Which cannot be quantified in a monetary term, and that's like loss of life, loss of health, or, or let's say loss of territory in the extreme case, in the cultural heritage and others, and so do the biodiversity and the ecosystem services. So these are some of the non-economic loss. So what can be done on loss and damage? We can avert, or or, or we can uh, we we try our best to avert the loss and damage, especially um, averting is through. Through uh, the high mitigation targets or or, or, or high adaptation uh, support, but if we cannot really avoid loss and damage, then we need to minimize, or we need to address loss and damage. And minimizing loss and damage could be many things. And these are some, just few examples that we highlighted in our report. Like minimizing loss and damage could be like early warning system or some you know, some scientific projection that will help you minimize in the longer term. Integrating climate climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction to better deal with comprehensive uh, risks. Like piloting forecast based based uh, based financing, which is already happening in some part, some part in Africa, what uh, our previous colleague George also mentioned briefly on that part, and building capacity on loss and damage is one of the key component that was also highlighted by by Hoffes in his intervention, as well as some establishing like a regional network and on sharing information on loss and damage. I think those those are some of the critical way that we can minimize loss and damage. But there are also other options on addressing. On addressing loss and damage could be inclusion of loss and damage in national policy and plans, which is really key. And the NDC is one of the key process. And the national adaptation plan or NAPS is also a second key component that we need to somehow look into that aspect. They're creating a national, national mechanism to address loss and damage. And what we are seeing in Bangladesh and Hafiz mentioned in his intervention before, this is also one of the way of addressing so loss and damage like some of the regional risk pooling mechanism, so that the Africa risk pooling or Caribbean risk pooling that is already happening right now. And some of the, some of the climate related loss and damage payout um, and that helps, um, that has for the source of protection. So, so that's also one of the key of addressing loss and damage. And some of the insurance mechanism, what German government has put forward on some of the insurance mechanism. So this is, these are some of the things, and these are not, um, exclusively, I think this is just a few things, and that can be added on later on. So, you know, what our report really highlight is, is there are if the country can take four key step, then it will be really good that the loss and damage can be anchored into industries. And the, the four key step, we try to make it as simply as we can. The first one is defining loss and damage in the national context. Second is more describing the current and potential loss and damage, highlighting the ongoing response and some of the specific contribution or target. And, and let, let me go in each detail on that. So defining loss and damage in the national context. Well, Hafiz yeah, mentioned before that loss and damage, you need to understand loss and damage from a national country perspective because each country differs from one place to another. Just to give example, the loss and damage that happens in my country, Nepal, is entirely different than loss and damage that happens in Sri Lanka. Just to give example, based on the based on the geographical structure, based on the landscape and everything, and also based on the population. So, so we need to understand loss and damage in a national context because each country is different to others. Though there are some similarities, but loss and damage needs to be understood from a national context. So it is really important for countries to, to define loss and damage in the national context in their NDC. Second, and the second key step is also, countries should describe the specific loss and damage that is already happening now. Uh, and that, that's, that's, really, that's really key. Mm. And also, um, what, what are some of the positive loss and damage into the different, I would say, sectors of geography also really key. Uh, 
in terms of identifying based on the different uh, emission as well as temperature scenario. And third one is mostly about highlighting what are the what what our individual country is is doing or, or ongoing initiative that is taking place to minimize or address loss and damage, and that could include any anything from the way from the policy to ongoing implementation to all the financing measures. So 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 these are some of the key things. But most importantly, uh, we also need to include some of the specific contribution or target on loss and damage in the country's NDC. And over here, I we include five of uh, the seven of them. The first one is data and information. So where on the data information side, we really need to consider consider measuring to improve climate related loss and damage data and data gathering and analysis, as well as information system, including scientific projects. Because many of the loss and damage data that we may have right now may not be scientifically uh, driven. So that is really key in terms of identifying some of the data, data and information. And research is also one of the key component if some of the data are gap. So identifying some of the potential loss and damage impacts, document some of the anticipated needs and gaps on loss and damage research, that's also really key. The capacity building, definitely this is one of the critical component when where the country needs to highlight uh, some of the, uh, I would say, knowledge and capacity for developing as well as using loss and damage assessment tool. You know, this is really key. And country, and country also needs to report on not only from the human technical capacity, but also the, the I would say, the, 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 the technical capacity related to how to analyze and how to address loss and damage in the long term perspective. And technology and highlighting technology innovation that country can need to undertake and also identify the technology gaps on the loss and damage at the national from the national circumstances is also really key. And the fifth one, more on the institutional setup. We, um, this is also came up before, but also more on the reviewing the suitability of the existing institution and also considering whether the existing institution mandate can be extended or we can create a new new institution to address loss and damage. The, the, the sixth one is on more on policy development intrication. So we basically over here what we are saying if, if countries need to aim to develop new and or revise policy and strategies to address loss and damage, and this policy could be in the mid to long term, and it, and and can also integrate into the national level five year national level planning project processes as well as cross sectoral planning processes, and and that's also key. And last and lastly on loss and damage finance, loss and damage finance is basically a, the financial need. That you need now and foreseeable future to address loss and damage from a national perspective. So these are some of the seven key, I would say, uh, areas where country can put forward what are their contribution or, or their targets in terms of how you address loss and damage at the national level. So these are all highlighted in our report, uh, the report that we did last uh, last October together with Practical Action, and you can download from this website. And I'm, and I'm happy to take any questions or query that we may have in a discussion later on. So let me stop there. And once again, thanks for this opportunity. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Jai. Um, we are also kind of running out of time, but uh, we have two more speakers to go before we open up for questions and answers. Just to let everyone know on the call, um, kindly do drop your questions for the speakers uh, on the chat, and we will take it forward during the question and answer session. We have our next speaker, Mr. Sunil Acharya. He's the Regional Advisor of Climate and Resilience at Practical Action. Mr. Acharya. First of all, thank you very much uh, to Slack and Trust for uh, inviting me into this uh, very important uh, event uh, and for the opportunity to share my uh, reflections on why uh, it is critical uh, to uh, incorporate or anchor uh, loss and damage into the nationally determined contribution process. Uh, I will not go into details of um, the, the significance or importance of uh, loss and damage uh, to be incorporated in the NDCs because uh, the previous speakers have already uh, uh, emphasized uh, it much. Uh, I'd also uh, like to thank uh, my previous speaker, uh, Mr. Sandeep Samlingai, my colleague, for um, highlighting some of the ways uh, that we can uh, anchor loss and damage into NDCs, which we jointly uh, authored and released um, last year, late last year. So uh, 
So uh, basically, I was looking into uh, you know what uh, the countries uh, have done after uh, the uh, yeah, you know uh, before the deadline uh, set uh, by the secretary to submit uh, the updated or enhanced uh, NDCs uh, to the, uh, the the United Nations Climate Change Framework Secretariat. Uh, uh, Despite uh, its critical importance, uh, if you look into uh, the submissions made so far, uh, very few uh, countries uh, have, uh, you know, um, emphasized the importance of loss and damage and uh, have made explicit uh, mention of that. I see there are at least uh, three uh, reasons uh, for that uh, lack of, uh, you know, inclusion of loss and damage. First, uh, uh, the developed countries still do not consider loss and damage is a critical issue, uh, partly because they don't want to support uh, the countries which are already experiencing loss and damage. The second uh, is the fact that uh, the way uh, the updated ordinance and NDCs are uh, structured, they, uh, most of them provide uh, the update of what, is, what they have done in terms of national policy, and implementation on climate action. So uh, uh, it uh, looks like uh, not much has been done on the loss and damage front. And thirdly, which we uh, emphasize in, in the report that Sandy presented, uh, is the lack of uh, guidance on how you know, countries can incorporate loss and damage. We tried to fill uh, that gap through that report, but uh, you know, uh, hopefully uh, the countries who are uh, updating the indices and will do so in the future uh, we'll take uh, the examples or, or the way that can be done from that. So uh, talking about uh, the countries which have made uh, mention of loss and damage, if you look into that, uh, for example, some of the countries like Cambodia, Grenada, or Nepal in their updates have uh, mentioned about uh, loss and damage. What they do is they don't provide the elaborated, uh, you know, uh, mention of it, but uh, they talk about uh, the, the uh, climate impacts they have experienced, which have residual uh, impacts, which cannot be addressed through mitigation or adaptation. They talk about uh, their aspiration for joining uh, Paris Agreement and mention that, uh, you know, they joined Paris Agreement because they thought, you know, they will not have to be at the uh, loss and damage and get support if uh, such things happen. Uh, thirdly, they also mention about the need to bring coherence between NDCs and NAP so that loss and damage issue can be uh, addressed comprehensively, uh, looking into the limits of adaptation. Uh, zooming in onto uh, Nepal, as I have been asked to talk a bit uh, on what Nepal has done. So basically, I, I think, uh, uh, you know, um, of what we've got so far uh, on these NDC submissions, Nepal uh, has championed the issue. Uh, basically, uh, you know, they talk about uh, developing a national strategy and action plan on loss and damage by 2025, uh, which uh, will, uh, you know, uh, be the basis uh, of addressing loss and damage in the country, looking into different sectors, uh, you know, different forms of uh, impacts and all sort of things. Uh, on top of that, the, uh, the updated NDC of Nepal also mentions about uh, the fact that they will develop a financial framework uh, which will look into financing and investment needs, and they will also uh, yeah, yeah, specifically categorize, uh, you know, adaptation in, um, financing uh, channelized into not only mitigation and, and adaptation, but also loss and damage, which I also think is very uh, critical. So uh, I think uh, that's uh, uh, very uh, important steps that uh, Nepal has taken, but uh, now they will be uh, developing the implementation uh, plan for the NDCs and uh, the details uh, will come into that and we will hopefully see that uh, the details will be more robust and they will uh, you know highlight some of the uh, critical needs that uh, the country will have to take uh, further uh, with I will emphasize with uh, because uh, you know they cannot do so without the international uh, support on on loss and damage so of uh, be it financial support be it technical uh, technological support or capacity building support so, uh, uh, so uh, uh, at the end, what I want to highlight here, um, uh, taking this opportunity, is the fact that uh, Practical Action is doing research on uh, what are the difficulties uh, you know countries are facing with loss and damage. Not only the reality of loss and damage they are facing, but the difficulties and challenges that they have 
to assess the kind of uh, you know losses and damages uh, they are experiencing. Uh, for example, we are uh, working on Nepal and Bangladesh, looking into some of the existing tools and methods and initiatives uh, that try to uh, assess climate change risk and also uh, develop adaptation planning. Uh, when we look into that, what we uh, come up with is uh, that. Uh, you know, many of the existing tools and methods and focus uh, that have on the, uh, these, uh, you know, assessments and planning processes do not look into loss and damage um, uh, uh, granularly, yes, in, in depth. Uh, uh, there are uh, several reasons uh, for that. One, there is a very little understanding of what loss and damage is, particularly, you know, countries still struggle to quantify what uh, the economic uh, losses and damages they are, they are facing. Uh, then there is uh, this, uh, you know, whole sort of non-economic losses and damages uh, they are experiencing, but they don't have any tools and methods uh, to assess or account for non-economic uh, losses and damages. Uh, many of the countries know how to uh, do post-disaster assessment of uh, losses and damages resulting from extreme, extreme events to some extent, but when it comes to a slow onset event, uh, you know, there are no mechanisms or tools uh, you know, which they can employ uh, to do the, the, the assessment of the, the real impact they'll, they are facing or they will be facing uh, uh, over the years. So uh, uh, all this is happening because, uh, you, you know, despite the fact that countries, uh, you know, uh, ha are experiencing loss and damage, they realize that they are experiencing loss and damage and it will have, you know, uh, severe impacts to their uh, economy. Uh, and not only to economy, but uh, also to several other aspects, such as uh, culture and you know, loss of tradition and, and all sort of things, including the displacement and migration they will be facing. Uh, but uh, because they do not have uh, the required support, uh, they do not have required uh, financing uh, to take uh, you know, initiatives to address uh, this critical issue, uh, they are lagging behind. So that's the experience of uh, the uh, developing country, most importantly, the LDCs. So with this, uh, I stop it here um, and very happy to take uh, questions if uh, any of you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Acharya. Um, we have our final speaker for the day, Ms. Victoria Zeitworth. She's the Associate Program Manager at CUNY Climate Insurance Initiative. Uh, Victoria, if you could unmute yourself and turn on your camera. And uh, just to let everyone know once again, to all those who are just joining us, um, if you could kindly first rename yourself with your country and also please do fill out the uh, registration form that I've linked on the chat. I'll drop the link once again. Uh, that would be great. So yes, and also if you have questions for the speaker so far, please do drop that in the chat as well and we will take it forward to the next session. Thank you very much and Victoria over to you. Thank you, Sunasha. Um, and thank you for having me today. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right. Um, so again, thank you for being here or for having me. Um, and also thank you to all the amazing speakers um, that have just uh, spoken. Um, I'm going to try and keep it brief and I will take a bit more uh, narrow perspective um, and look at the integration of disaster risk finance um, only uh, into NDCs as part of this presentation. So let me very briefly start with um, why um, we, we integrate loss and damage into NDCs and very simply put it's because we want to protect uh, what's otherwise lost and damaged um, and specifically to ensure that the adaptation efforts that countries undertake um, are safeguarded. So that's to say that adaptation and disaster risk finance are different um, but they shouldn't be viewed in, in competition but they should be viewed as complementary and simply put Adaptation focuses on investments, uh, for instance, in climate-proof infrastructure to reduce the impacts of climate change. An example we can see that here um, would be the building of a dam to keep rising sea levels at bay. And financial protection, on the other hand, then uh, concentrates on providing us with immediate financial liquidity for cases where, uh, for example, sea level rise combines with sudden onset events um, and the dam that was built isn't enough anymore to, to prevent flooding. And having access to immediate liquidity after disasters um, has been proven essential to rebuild and recover uh, quickly and has been identified as one of the key elements uh, to ensure that people 
uh, businesses and overall uh, economies uh, remain on upward uh, development paths and uh, aren't, um, aren't put uh, at risk of, uh, of reversing hard won development gains. Um, and even or equally important, um, integrating disaster risk finance into NDCs is uh, instrumental to deliver the, the transformational shifts um, that we want NDCs uh, see to deliver uh, in order to protect and safeguard economic growth uh, of vulnerable uh, developing countries. And um, if we look um, at the resilience components of NDCs, <clears throat> Disaster risk finance can support and catalyze progress in several of the areas that, um, that other speakers have mentioned um, here before. Um, for one, we should look at the fact that uh, risk pricing, which is part of, of the uh, insurance design uh, and buying, let's say, process, can incentivize risk-informed uh, planning and investments uh, in resilience. And it does so um, by basically putting a price tag on risk and the introduction of risk finance instruments helps to detect um, uh, risk. Insurance policies are concluded on the basis of a systematic uh, risk assessment, whereby the price of insurance depends on the level uh, of risk and the recognition stemming from, from such risk pricing um, can incentivize risk-informed planning and it can add value uh, to investments um, in tools for disaster risk reduction, uh, risk management, um, and risk finance and can therefore also ideally, you know, incentivize uh, enhanced uh, investments uh, and adaptation. And that would occur, for example, when uh, uh, risk reduction investments would decrease uh, the height of the necessary investment, for example, the premium height in uh, risk finance uh, measures. And by putting a price tag on risk, uh, governments and, and private sector can thus gain uh, information or access to the information um, that's necessary to incentivize and inform um, the development of economic policies um, and strategies that shift public and private resources toward climate resilience uh, and, and transformative growth. As a second component, um, and we heard that I think um, in several presentations, including uh, from, from the colleague of WWF, um, is the fact that countries at the moment still struggle to understand um, their, let's say, resilience baselines of what would actually be lost and damaged under different uh, climate uh, scenarios. And resilience baselines are needed in order to adequately plan, price, and prioritize investments in adaptation, in risk reduction, and in risk finance. Um, they basically present the starting point um, of doing so. And when introducing disaster risk financing instruments, one of the key components here is to start with a comprehensive risk assessment to understand what uh, risk layer, what slice of the risk would actually be feasible um, to be covered by, for example, insurance uh, or other, or other uh, financial instruments and what other slices of risk are better addressed uh, through risk reduction adaptation to arrive at the most cost effective. A combination of different instruments. So looking at disaster risk finance as part of formulating the NDCs um, can support access uh, to, to the data that is needed. And lastly, and that is sort of a combination of, of the, the two elements that I just mentioned, is that the instruments that we use um, for the introduction of risk uh, instruments, um, risk financing instruments, um, the planning instruments when it comes to the risk assessment as well as the pricing, um, can support the cost benefit analyses that go into designing policies to making countries and economies more, more climate resilient and can help to identify the cost effective combination, not only of different disaster risk finance instruments, but much more importantly, the cost effective combination of adaptation risk reduction interventions plus risk finance uh, instruments, different kinds of risk finance instruments to, to safeguard the efforts um, that we take uh, to, to protect people and uh, economies. Now, where do we stand right now? Um, MCII has done a study looking at uh, the NDCs in 2017 uh, and looking specifically at uh, the incorporation of disaster risk finance instruments in those NDCs. Um, that was done with a word search looking at terms such as insurance, uh, credit, um, risk transfer. 
And in 2017, we could see that we had 25% of uh, non-Annex 1 countries mentioned. So as I said, we could see that the leading groups sort of uh, came from Africa and the Middle East, followed by uh, Caribbean and Latin America, uh, Asia Pacific, and one in Europe that being, being uh, Moldova. In 2020, or basically as of January 2021, we can see that 30% of non-Annex 1 countries uh, mentioned disaster risk finance in their NDCs. Um, so that includes the update NDCs as well as the second NDCs that have been submitted until December uh, 2020. We can now see that there has been some increase uh, in the Caribbean and Latin America, but the most significant increase of, um, of NDCs came from um, Asia and the Pacific, with uh, currently 15 different countries mentioning disaster risk finance in their NDCs. Um, so we can see that there is growth. Um, but potentially there isn't, um, yeah, there, there isn't too or enough integration, let's say, uh, so far, given the benefits, you know, and given the importance of disaster risk finance, specifically when it comes to safeguarding um, adaptation efforts. And what we can see, and this is also um, where I will uh, conclude, what we can see for one is that DRF instruments would need to be integrated more strongly, but also where we can see them integrated um, they are integrated in relatively loose terms, so relatively separate from, from adaptation. And uh, what would probably be, be best in, 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 in terms of staying with the, with the cost-effective and also most impactful combination of adaptation and, and risk finance would be to clearly have this integrated and linked uh, to each other um, within the NDCs. What we uh, can also see um, from an analysis of a paper that's forthcoming that MCRI did together with the Interest of Global Partnership, the CVF 20 Secretariat, the NDC Partnership and UNFCCC is that several re countries request for support by the, um, of the NDC Partnership on implementing disaster risk finance and specifically on, uh, on adaptation planning. And what we can see there is that there is, and this has also been mentioned, there is still a gap in terms of the data, the information, the methodologies that are needed to bring those together, to plan adaptation, to set your resilience baselines and to then see what risk finance measures would be, would be needed. So there is a strong need to increase countries' capacities, not only with a view to disaster risk finance per se, but with regards to the combination of those two. And effective means uh, that, that would help in, in, that, uh, in that area are for one, to raise the awareness uh, of the benefits uh, of integrating disaster risk finance into NDCs beyond just the immediate financial uh, liquidity argument that is the, the, the most prominent one of disaster risk finance, but looking more at the transformational shifts that we can achieve in the entire adaptation area. Um, that needs to be coupled with uh, better access to, to relevant information, uh, methodologies, decision-making tools um, to really arrive at integrated resilience uh, portfolios in the NDCs. And lastly, and this is also a, a topic that I think uh, we will discuss further today, is to promote country-driven access, um, not only to private sector capital and expertise that comes with disaster risk finance, um, but also to public resources to support, you know, the setup of uh, risk financing schemes and to also support the, the affordability um, of, for example, insurance schemes, whether they are at the micro at the macro level. And with this, I would like to conclude here. I'm happy to... Uh, uh, reply to any questions and obviously to discuss this further in the breakout groups. So thank you very much. Thanks, Victoria, and um, thank you all the speakers for the presentation. So I would now like to request um, everyone on the call to maybe drop your questions for all of the speakers and until just drop your question on chat and we could take it forward to next to the discussion. Um, until that is done, we have a Mentimeter that we've set up. So just log on to menti.com and use code 849 um, Just like a quick um, icebreaker, so to speak, on uh, on where you're joining us from. Let me just share my screen as well. Right, so please log on to uh, www.menti.com and use the code 849 And I hope you could see my screen. Yeah. And someone on the chat just said there's someone from Afghanistan. All right. Um, again, if you also join us from Facebook, uh, you please log on to menti.com and use the code 8498234.
also if you have questions for the speakers kindly do drop this uh, drop the questions on the chat as well right so keep it on for a few minutes more yeah. just to uh, let also everyone know that the uh, registration form also did have more countries uh, so maybe everyone's probably not participating in the meeting oh yeah we have someone from cameroon thank you very much for joining right okay so let's move on to the next question um so what basically how would you best describe your organization so visiting all the from a cso a government organization a private organization academia or other right we have five cso six CSO. okay right um we have two from academia all right and kindly do uh, uh drop while this is happening kindly do drop any questions you would have uh, on the chat for the speakers that looks like um all right so we have nine uh, participants from CSOs, four from government organizations, two from private organizations, two from academia, and three from other. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Ten from CSOs. Right, uh, thank you very much. And uh, we do have about 15 minutes more left for questions and answers. Um, if any, if perhaps the speakers could all turn on their mics uh, and their cameras, we could uh, make this as interactive as possible. And if anyone has any questions, kindly do drop them on the chat. Just a quick note, uh, Sanasha, Hafiz had to leave because he had a medical emergency at home. Um, so anything that I could answer, he asked me to answer. Just let him. Everyone seems to be shy to ask questions. Uh, I would maybe like to start with one. So um, maybe like when we're looking at like nationally determined contributions and the role of CSOs, um, and this is an open question to everybody, if uh, maybe we could look at what an entry point would be to bring in the discussion of loss and damage into NDCs, mm -hmm. um, this is open for anyone to answer. But if we could have that as the first question, any volunteers from the speakers would like to take that. If anyone else wants to answer first, if not, I could just do it. But it's nice if someone else from outside the organization answers first. So would you like to go first, Hamdi, Victoria, Samir, anyone, George, if you're still on this? Uh, fr from uh, if I give an example of Kenya, uh, uh, the the way the process of uh, uh, of updating uh, NDC is, is structured is that uh, it it brings together both uh, government and non-state actors, uh, and and in fact, a large part of the contribution is done by the civil society organisations because uh, for one reason, which I think many of you know, uh, civil society seems to have more information uh, about, uh, for example, uh, loss and damage as compared to government because they interact with communities on the ground, they, they, they document the challenges communities face and, and therefore they are able to bring on board the, the various challenges. And interestingly in Kenya, the, the initial draft, uh, the updated NDC did not have loss and damage. It's, it's until it went through a review process now where uh, a larger uh, community of, uh, of practitioners uh, were looking at, and more importantly from the civil society, that now uh, loss and damage was included as a heading uh, and, and uh, specific uh, uh, provisions were actually made uh, to, to speaking to loss and damage. So uh, civil, in, in our context, from the very beginning, uh, the civil society have space, and and uh, the, the the they are part of the thematic working groups, adaptation and, and loss and damage mitigation and the rest. And therefore, uh, we, they are able to bring on board uh, a lot more information than what uh, the government uh, uh, has. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Bankoya. Uh, would anyone else also like to maybe take that question? Yeah. Yeah. If I may, when you ask about the entry point of, of the loss and damage, uh, as I said in my presentation, I think you need to articulate to your national government regarding regarding what's happening on, on the ground. Just to give example, in the case of Nepal, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just, though I'm not based here, I think Sunil and others can give much more better understanding 
Yeah, but if if what I have to say is basically in the context of Nepal, one of the key uh, loss and damage that what we see is extreme weather events in terms of the flooding, or I would say the glaciers melting, or, or the glacier lakes outward flood. And these are some of the examples or some of the extreme events that what we are seeing in in, in our country as as a mountainous region. So just to articulate that we are talking about climate change and, and the impact caused by the climate change. And glacier retreat and glacier less outward flood is, is a clear indication um, that is happening by climate change. So articulating that, not really talking about loss and damage um, as a jargon, but more about the articulating, articulating some of the impacts what you see at the national level. And, and in a way, briefing our, I would say, key government. And like George says, many of the civil society are already working into that space. Uh, forming an ally that will really that will really help, uh, and 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 you can slowly be able to help with the government because uh, there are expertise both in the government sector as well as civil society, and and we really need to complement each other in terms of the expertise or the or the lessons uh, that we have in both government and the civil society. So 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 that is how we can you can slowly brace the. Uh, um, I would say that will be an entry point in terms of uh, defining that and how to put that everything is entirely depends upon the national level consultation or, or, or I would say engagement and that, that also bringing all these research organizations including private sectors and others including the local communities and but some of the work that what we as a double and practical action did is just a kind of broad framework that will allow or help country to to navigate on this on this on this topic that is really coming up, and I would say a little bit in the early stage compared to what we have experienced on mitigation or on on or on adaptation. So, in in summary, uh, uh, highlighting the loss and damage that is happening in in at the national context, articulating that into into the way that our policymaker understand in in uh, at the local level or at the national level, and I would say that's an entry point and. I would say many of the countries are already in the process of preparing the national adaptation plan or NAPS that also somehow a little bit able to, to highlight what's happening. In, uh, and, and that also allow you to a little bit articulate in terms of how to, how to quantify or how to address loss and damage into the national context. So let me stop there. These are some, some random points from my end. Over. Thank you very much, Mr. Rai. Uh, so we do have a few more questions. I think we can take what one or two more. So are there good examples? Sorry, Sunny, uh, yes. just to jump in. I think okay. Sunil wanted to add uh, before Sandeep spoke. So maybe we could ask Sunil to answer before we go. Yes, uh, so, so thanks, Bosita. So uh, basically, uh, some of the points I wanted to flag uh, have already been raised by uh, Sandeep. But uh, on top of that, I think uh, you know it is very important to know where the process is uh, in terms of NDC formulation or, or of its implementation, so that we can, uh, you know, at right time, um, you know, uh, can possibly influence the process. Uh, there are a couple of ways we can uh, engage in this process, um, you know. Um, uh, on top of uh, you know bringing in the evidence from the ground, um, you know, talking about loss and damage in non-technical jargon um, way, so that uh, the policymakers understand it better. But uh, you know, actually, how we can do that uh, is um, one. Uh, you know, in uh, is climate change courts across many different sectors uh, and themes. Uh, we uh, may not be necessarily sp uh, be speaking with the climate focal points in the country, but we, we oftentimes work with uh, sectoral line agencies and ministries. So uh, maybe if we have access to those uh, sectoral agencies, then we can bring this uh, issue uh, from those sectoral issues, which uh, you know understand it better. For example, I can uh, you know draw uh, from my experience from Nepal, wherein uh, we were working with uh, the Ministry of Agriculture. Uh, and the new, you know, climate change is uh, is, uh, is a critical issue for um, agriculture sector in Nepal, and uh, they knew that uh, agriculture sector is already experiencing loss and damage. So uh, when uh, the climate uh, nodal ministry was not, um, you know, um, much of confident on including this issue, uh, we talked with uh, uh, that ministry, and they they were 
you know, on our behalf, speaking about uh, this uh, issue. So the, uh, this this kind of tactics uh, also, you know, sometimes help. Uh, we can form coalitions of uh, civil society through which our uh, voice is bigger. We can also mobilize media, uh, which uh, you know, bring in uh, issue to the front. So uh, th there are several different ways uh, that we can employ. Uh, but uh, you know, uh, our own capacity is also key. So uh, yeah. Uh, just wanted to share our experience working on this process. Thanks very much, Mr. Acharya. Uh, Vasuta, would you have any input on this? Yeah, thank you, Sani. Uh, so just to add on how we found entry points to work on loss and damage, I think one op option that we can focus on a regular manner uh, would be the national communications for countries, because that could contribute to data uh, that's needed for assessing losses and damages and also risks uh, that need to be addressed. Uh, and then we are looking at uh, the West International Mechanism and Loss and Damage discussion. There are certain elements that we could focus on, for example, um, the risk management component and risk transfer component, which could be through um, the climate and disaster risk transfer insurance, um, the finance systems such as that, the innovative financial mechanisms, uh, and then also the multi-actor partnerships and the engagement of different actors in addressing losses and damages. Um, and then also, as uh, Sandeep and some others mentioned, the national adaptation plans process um, and the resilience building component. And I do agree with Sunil about different sectors um, because some of the work that we do uh, doesn't necessarily mean it's only about the NDC process in the sense of climate change action, but while it's climate change related action, it has a sectoral specific uh, focus as well. So for example, the disaster and climate um, hazard impacts or the impacts of these two elements on agriculture and the crop damage and losses could be a component of loss and damage. So how we work with different systems would be also entry points through identification of key sectors and how we address the losses and damages in them. And any actions and national policies that relate to sustainable development, send that framework on disaster risk reduction. I feel that's a long term uh, title. So, so the send that framework could also be an option for us to work at national level and connect the NDC's loss and damage to data needs and other stakeholder engagement uh, at country level uh, to focus on loss and damage. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, thanks very much, Vasuta. I think we can take in one more question because we also want to open up the floor for participants to share any experience they have from work related loss and damage from their organization. Uh, so I'm just going to pick the question from Adi. Yeah, so are there, um, or maybe we could do the next one. Uh, are, is there finance available for loss and damage if, if yes how accessible is finance for vulnerable communities that have suffered loss and damage without any compensation from their government um this is once again open to all speakers who would like to answer this i see what they are wanting to volunteer no i was going to volunteer someone else i was going to ask that victoria might want to add uh, something to this uh, i can i can briefly add um but it's, it's it's not an easy question right whether there is a finance available for loss and damage so if you look at the unif triple c uh, if you look at the climate negotiations the global climate negotiations you do have finance dedicated to mitigation you do have finance dedicated to adaptation so far there isn't uh an official dedication of, of finance to to loss and damage because the issue per se is uh, is still heavily discussed um within within the climate negotiations so that's that's the one answer if you if we look at the unif triple c however that isn't to say that for example the green climate fund doesn't provide funding or support for example for uh for projects that uh, address sudden onset events um Sudden onset events such as uh, heat waves, for example, droughts, hurricanes, uh, and heavy rain, um, and that support there. I think the last time that we checked, it was um, around I think something between fifteen to twenty projects that that had support for for these type of uh, loss and damage related events, and specifically focused on disaster risk uh, finance, for example, insurance approaches. So that's sort of within the UN uh, climate negotiations and the instruments under the UNFCCC um, as an immediate answer. Now, if we look at instruments outside of the convention, and I'm 
I'm, I'm focusing on sudden onset events, not on slow onset events. Um, looking at sudden onset events, um, we, we do have uh, international initiatives such as, for example, the Interest Global Partnership um, that aims to increase the financial protection uh, for people, uh, vulnerable people in vulnerable developing countries suffering from, from sudden onset events um, to 500 million people by 2025. And for that, there comes uh, support uh, for these kind of projects and programs. By, by the donor community, including Germany, the UK, Canada, um, and several others. So there is, there is finance um, available for events that are related to loss and damage um, being accessed at the community level directly, I think, uh, is, is difficult. But the interest of the partnership, for example, is putting a focus on uh, on aiming to, to include vulnerable communities, marginalized communities strongly in the, in the planning process and to enhance needs responsive uh, uh, coverage and protection. But direct access, I think, is, is difficult, or at least from the, from the international level where, where I come from. But maybe Vosita and, and colleagues have um, additional insights here. Thanks very much, Victoria. Um, I'm wondering if anyone, any of the other panelists would like to also answer that question. Yeah, so um, basically that, that, that's a very uh, critical question uh, about whether the financing for loss and damage is available or not. Uh, as uh, Victoria mentioned uh, in her intervention, uh, so there are certain financing instruments uh, um, available for, you know, actions which might contribute to uh, minimizing or addressing loss and damage. But uh, to tell you the fact that uh, at the UNFCC, the developing countries are, you know, fighting for too long to have a dedicated financing mechanism so that, uh, you know, sufficient uh, financing is, a, is available in countries. Uh, to take actions to address loss and damage, but uh, it's a hard fight, it's still a long way to go, uh, but uh, hopefully let's uh, see the progress will be made in due course of uh, time. So yeah, uh, that's it. Um, thanks very much. If I want, if any of the other panelists would like to add, or if not, I would like to pass it up. Yeah, just a quick addition. So we have four days of discussions, and I think we'll be discussing this further uh, on our last day of discussions. We have a few speakers specifically presenting on how finance and loss and damage connect. But just to add, I think while there are different elements um, that gets financed, which are within uh, the discussion on loss and damage, we also need to have that specific allocation of um, finance for loss and damage, because we talk about risk assessments that connect with loss and damage. But that would also be adaptation funding uh, when it comes to national adaptation plans and resilience building. So um, this is a broader conversation. If, if someone is thinking of how different elements that relate to loss and damage gets funded, then some of it has certain funding sources, but is it necessarily for loss and damage that the funding is allocated is the question, I believe. Um, so we can have a longer discussion on this uh, on the 21st. We have a few speakers who will be speaking on this as well. Um, and that has a focus on climate risk transfer and different financial tools that focus on it as well. Uh, I don't know that George wants to add from the African perspective because uh, the African countries are very strong uh, in terms of the climate finance um, focus in G77, which relates to loss and damage. So if he wants to add anything before we move forward uh, to the next session, that might be great as well. No, no, no. I think I think uh, colleagues have already covered the the key issue is that um, uh, we have whim, and I think uh, well, the, the argument that uh, is being advanced is how do we facilitate countries to address loss and damage, and and, and therefore uh, uh, we need to be very creative, uh, so that uh, if possible, is a window uh, within the within the GCF or other climate financing uh, arrangements uh, so that uh, uh, loss and damage is treated uh, with, uh, with the seriousness it requires. But at the moment, uh, that is still uh, uh, not there. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, speakers. I would now like to maybe 
we are running short of time, but I would maybe like to open up the floor for uh, for the participants to maybe share experience from your work related to loss and damage very briefly. You could raise your hand if you could, or maybe you could unmute yourself and very briefly in about uh, a minute or two share any experiences uh, in relation to what we've been speaking. So I um, I was wondering, Gabriel, if you are able to unmute yourself, perhaps you would like to provide uh, some input of what you've been making note of on the chat. Well, thank you very much for giving me my uh, opportunity to share something about, particularly for the indigenous communities. Actually, I was uh, attending another program, but uh, uh, using the <laughs> my cell phone. That's why uh, that's why I'm uh, a bit uh, in the, some crowded places. Anyway, uh, yeah. in short term, I, uh, I can explain somehow. The indigenous communities, you know, uh, living in the Tirong Hill Peaks area, in the, uh, hilly terrain and the mountainous. Uh, since they're living in a far away, so all the uh, all the difficulties i mean uh, this is very difficult to uh, ensure the access including uh, transports and other uh, basic social services as well therefore uh, all the loss and damage mostly if something happened to, uh, from the outside so that's why we think we as belong to the indigenous communities and even in the area it could be very better especially for the government and other international and national communities as well to engage the local community so that they can ensure they can uh, uh, think of how to solve their problems. So this is very important today. I have learned about this and this is very important uh, to share together all the information. This uh, that may help to me also to, to distribute the information to other uh, my community. Also. Hello. Yes, yes, I can hear you. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, thank you very much for giving the time and, uh, yeah, giving the opportunity to share a few words with you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Henry David Bayo, who's raised your hand, would. Yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity. So... Would you be able, sorry, Mr. Mr. Bayo, would you be able to speak up a bit more? Yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity to participate in this webinar. Yeah, of course, I just want to highlight uh, our own situation. I'm from Sierra Leone, in town Sierra Leone. And in terms of loss and damage, of course, we, based on past studies, we've been identified as the fourth most vulnerable country uh, after Bangladesh. And I still remember in 2017, uh, uh, we had a serious disaster which took the lives of so many people, of us, of which most Sierra Leoneans can remember. A lot of lives were lost, people died, property were destroyed. And what was done is that we, the support of the World Bank, an assessment was done, basically to identify the, the magnitude of the disaster. And most importantly, is that the recovery needs across identified sectors. So one thing I've been about loss and damage is, is recovery needs, and this can be sector based in helping people recover from loss and damage. And also, it is important to, uh, uh, to divide the different recovery needs, because we, it can be the short term, the medium term, and the long term needs. So, so this should be prioritized, and that's what the World Bank did in the assessment based on the flooding we had the august 14 flooding in 2017 which killed a lot of uh, 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 people a lot of people we are dead and a lot of property will be destroyed so basically uh, the recovery needs and how i think countries can be supported in terms of these different priority recovery needs is very difficult once again thanks for the opportunity to participate in the webinar Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And um, before we go into breakout groups, I'm wondering very quickly within the next 30 seconds if everyone could turn on their cameras and if we could maybe take a group picture just to uh, celebrate our first day.
we do have an exciting group work uh, we do have exciting group work coming up but if you could quickly um could wait we have just 10 seconds go until everyone okay then everyone say uh please i guess and we'll take one more all right uh, so thank you very much um and thank you to all of the speakers and thank you to those who joined on facebook